Hello, Revere, and welcome to another great Revere Veterans and Community Show. We have a special guest today. She's been on before, but she, during this time, from the last time I met her till now, she's made a couple of trips, and she's been to Germany, and I want to welcome Olivia Ferranti. Olivia, thank you, thank you for taking the time to come on our show. Th thank you very much for inviting me. You are a retired school teacher. Yes. Before we get into the crux of the trip, tell us a little about yourself. Well, um, I went to the Revere Schools. I went to Regis College, Boston College, for my master's degree in Leslie College. What's your and major in? My specialty, well, my major in college was history and minor in music, but my um, specialty that I went to Boston College to, for was to teach blind children. Where I can't see very well myself, I thought I could have a lot of empathy and know just what they were going through. And, and that's why I picked that field. I could have just been a regular teacher, but I wanted to do that. And I, I was able to <laughs> for 17 years. That wasn't my first job, but that was my main job right. that I loved. By the way, you also do a lot of work for the church for the Immaculate Conception. So yeah. tell us a little about that, too. Yes, um, I'm a lector. I was picked uh, 20 years ago by the pastor to be a lector, which means I read at, at the whatever mass I'm assigned to. And I have a booklet that's in Braille. Last time I was here, I brought it with me. And, and Braille is these little bumps that you really can't see because they're the same color as the paper. But I read it with my fingers like this so I can look at the people and um, so they can hear me. And how do you get these little bumps on the paper? Well, um, I have a, th this I did with a brailler, which was invented before the typewriter. It has six keys for the six dots, it has a space bar in the middle, uh, a, a little button that makes things go backwards, uh, one, a little handle that makes the paper roll, j just like a typewriter. But it, it punches the dots instead of uh, having ink, like a typewriter does. Good, and now the next thing I was gonna ask you, I see you have a couple of things here that you, uh, well, I like to call them, inventions yes. that you that you yourself dug up right i um i use a walking stick a lot when i go on the subway to keep my balance and one day i had this and i dropped it on the train it didn't hit anybody but this little kid was across from me and she got sort of scared because it made a big noise so i said i gotta do something so that i won't drop the darn thing so i took a, a, a knitted band that i had done and i sewed it and what i do is when i use it I put it like this, and then I, I hold it, you know, when I'm walking. And if I happen to have to let go for some reason, it just doesn't go on the ground. You know, so that would be good for the senior citizens in the city of Rivera yeah. at our, our senior well, center well, because a lot of them drop their canes, yeah. so we pick it up for them. Well, some canes, I have one, I don't have it anymore, I, gave, I donated, it has a hole here. And a, and a cloth that comes out. You don't have to knit something. You can just tie a cloth around it, you know, to make your own. You know what I mean? You could just use a piece of cloth. You wouldn't have to. I just happened to knit, so I did that. And the other thing was I saw on TV, they advertised if um, people that walk, especially us elderly people, the, the plastic handles of the bags can bite into your hands when you're not wearing gloves like in the summer. And there was something they advertised, and I went to the store to buy it, and they didn't have it. I said, okay, I'm not going to buy any. It was plastic. I said, I'm going to create my own. On my way home from the store, I thought, what to do? I took a scarf. You can even take a, a long piece of cloth. It doesn't matter. I sewed it, but you, can, you don't have to sew it. You can just tie it, but I want it to be good. And if I have a bag, usually a big one, but I just brought this little one. I put the, I put the uh, cloth through like this. And I hold it, and the soft cloth goes near my hands instead of the rough, sharp plastic. And that's what I do. I have two of them. Two old scarves that were in perfect condition. I just never used them. <laughs> so that was my two inventions for myself. But if it gives somebody an idea, um, you don't have to be a seamstress or anything to do them. You can just do them with a piece of cloth. Right. Now, before we get into your trip to Germany, I was looking at this book that you have laying on the table. And uh, when you started your trip, where did you start from and how did you Okay, this was in 1980. My mother and I took a, a trip to Belgium and Germany. We flew to Belgium, and um, since my father didn't want to go, we, we took uh, the best tour in those days, I don't know if they still exist, called Moppen Tour, and there were only 14 people on the trip. 
And I think, every, I think except for our guide, who was a gentleman named Kurt, I think everybody was a lady. I'm pretty sure they probably, I would think I was the only young person that, <laughs> that was on the trip. But they were lo lovely ladies. And we had a little bus, you know, and we had to take us to different places. So after we went through Belgium, we got in the train and we went to Germany. So, of course, we started in the north because Belgium is north of Germany. Um, and we, a couple places, we didn't really stop too long. We went to the famous uh, American base and they just rode us around in the bus and we all waved and cheered and it was, it was a lot of fun. And we went to Bonn. We didn't stay there. We just went through it and they show like this is where Beethoven is and this is the capital right now because this is 1980 before they reunited, before the Berlin Wall came down. Right. And then we continued and we went to Augsburg and we went to a church and we saw the first stained glass that still existed. It was like a thousand years old. And then the guide said, let's just walk along the street and stop here. And there was a big parade that started. And it was beautiful. They had horses and carriages with the with all decorations, with the spokes of the wheels, and the people had the you know the beautiful long dresses and the you know the old kinds of uh, German customs. Yeah, and they were throwing candy. So I said to him, "Well, what is this? Some big holiday?" Oh no, he says, "This is just a beer festival. If that's what they do in a beer festival, imagine when they have a real holiday. It was fantastic, <laughs> and he knew about it. So that was like an extra thing that we we stopped and saw that it was great." And then we went to Cologne, which is uh, the main thing I remember about Cologne. We went to the famous cathedral. cathedral right. It has those two spires. <laughs> yep. And it's where the, the wise men were buried, and there was a shrine of Our Lady, and, and um, that, was, that was very nice. And we went, took a cruise on the Rhine River, which was gorgeous. We saw those cliffs with the little castles up yep. there, and you know, where the Lorelei used to lure the sailors to you know, jump in the, you know, all you know, stuff about Wagner and all that kind of stuff. Very, very interesting. But then we went to Bavaria, and that's where the real interest, you know, not the only interesting, but the most, I'd say, most interesting part, because we stayed there the longest. We went to Munich, and that's where we got this Stein. Now, this is where they have the Oktoberfest. That's right. I was going to say, is there any beer in there, by the way? No, it's ah. empty. <laughs> in fact, no beer has ever been in it. The, <laughs> okay. the thing about this is, it's very interesting. When you have it on the table, it doesn't do anything. So let's say, let's say you gave it to, like I say, I gave it to my father and he wanted to have a drink. Well, when you lift it up. Oh, it plays nice music. Yeah, only when it's lifted up. It's like you can't sneak. <laughs> and, and it's very pretty. It has different decorations on it. It's funny, I brought home two beer steins when I was stationed in Germany, but uh, they were a musical beer stein, but they were really beautiful uh, beer steins. They were probably big, too. This is just, you know, for a souvenir. And, you know, the funny thing, I looked on the bottom of it, and it was made in Switzerland. <laughs> but they're good for music boxes over uh, there in Switzerland. You know, i got to tell you, every time when I was stationed in Germany, during Oktoberfest, which is in the city of Munich, Bavaria, that's all they have, steins, but that, not that size. I mean, they are huge. Or they have those big, huge beer glasses. They fill them up with the dark beer, <laughs> and they all get together, and they sing a song, you know. It's yeah. a real camarad yeah, camarade. They, they, they sh we went through Munich, and the man would point at places, and he'd go, look at that place. You could see, like, there was a cellar. He goes, that's where the, the drunks hang out in the daytime. <laughs> Did and you visit the Opera House in Munich? I don't think so. We mostly were, we went around the city, but we we saw the very famous glockenspiel that had got bombed in the, yep. in the big square, and when the little figures came out, when, when the clock rang, right. it was a little off key, but they told us that's because it had been bombed. It was bombed, the whole place was bombed a lot in the war. I imagine you saw that. We didn't, because it was 1980, so... You know, the Germans are very industrious. They must have, you know, cleared up everything, after, you know, in all those years. I got to tell you, when I was in Germany, and I'm talking 46, 47, 48, when I went to the cities where I was stationed, like in Berlin, Frankfurt, Munich, Wiesbaden, those, uh, Nuremberg, those places were bombed. I mean, not the whole city was leveled, but the places were bombed. Especially, there was one German city that I remember, 
was called Essen. It was the ironworks where they made the steel for the Germans. Oh, so and that those, was a big target. Uh, a very big target by the bombs, by the Allied planes. So Germany was in ruins. But in 1983, I think it must have all been rebuilt because when I see it on TV, it's beautiful now. Well, um, w when I remember we were talking, the, you know, we were sitting having dinner one night and we were talking before we got to Germany. And I happened to say something like, well, if they didn't start the trouble, they wouldn't have got bombed. And the guy was Dutch, and he said, "You're right." <laughs> you know, he really, he he knew. I I don't know. He might have even been old enough to have been in the war. I, I, it's possible, you know. So. Um, well, they had a fanatical leader. I have to say that. Yeah. They, they they fell for him, and they and then by the time they realized it, it was too late. If you opened your mouth, you died. Exactly. So they were scared. You exactly. You couldn't even, in other words, he, when he became chancellor of Germany, he abolished all the other parties that were right. there. And it would only be the Nazi party that would be Absolutely. the representation of the German people. And like you say, if you open up your mouth or disagree with the Nazis, you either went into a concentration camp or you got killed, literally. Well, I, I wouldn't have lasted there because they got rid of all the handicapped people. That's right. They just rounded them up and they, they, they didn't think they were worthy them. of life and they killed them. Right. So. That's what, and you know the funny thing, well funny, I shouldn't use that word funny. When they started euthanizing the people that were uh, disabled, let's say, the, yeah. the, the dis with disabilities. Especially with the retarded. They Exa yep. That was the beginning of the genocidal of the other people that they started. Right. They found out about the gas. And you know, the company that made that gas, and I worked in that building, by the way, which was a Frankfurt, was the IG Farben building. And they made the Cyclone B gas, the ones oh. that you would drop them from the uh, top while the people were taking a, about that. Yeah. a shower, so-called shower. Oh. So I remember seeing some of those places in there. But I want to get back to something that's real good. And this is a book that you can came back and it's called Passion Over Amagal, right. which is down in Bavaria near That's Munich. Right. That's but right. I want you to talk about it since okay. you were there. We, we, uh, this was the actual, why we went on the trip was because of, of, this, of this passion play that's only every 10 years. The interesting thing is they, when they finished the play, like say they don't have it this year, but let's say they had it in 2010. Then they start preparing for the next play they prepare for 10 years. Everybody in the town has a role to play in, in this. And, and I'll just show you some of the pictures that are really pretty. They are beautiful, by the way. And, and it's in the mountains. And when they're not doing the play, they do a lot of wood carving and stuff like that. They'll sh just show you a few. And they're very, we stayed in an inn. And in front of the inn, the lady, it was the lady who owned it. She had all the name of the inn in flowers, you know, flower beds. I think, it, I think her name was Louise. And what we did was we'd go to the, we'd have breakfast, we'd go to the play, they'd give us blankets, we'd go in this big theater that was sort of like a Coliseum type thing, and we'd sit there because it was, it was, we had a cover over us, but it was, it was open on the stage. And then we'd go and have dinner and come back in the afternoon because it was all day. And in the afternoon, because it was the mountains, when it came time for the crucifixion and all that, uh, it always gets cloudy. So that's exactly what happened at the crucifixion. They had the clouds and the darkness and everything like that. So th it was, they were so efficient. Right, show them the mountains in there. Okay, they, they had all the um, doorways with all different letters and you had tickets with, um, you know, where you went. Let me just put this one, and then there's another one. This is where Oberama Gal, if, if, if you can get just a little bigger blow up of this there. Let me get this out of the way. Okay. And you can see there how beautiful it looks with the mountains there. It's beautiful. Yep. And so that, that, was, that was our main, you know, the main reason we went. But we also, on the way, went, went what they called the Roman Road, the Romantic Road. And we went to this place called Rotenburg. Now, in the 1600s, you know, the plague was everywhere. So Oberammergau shut themselves off. They were, they were saved from the plague because of that. That's why they had the Passion Play in Thanksgiving. But there was this other town called Rotenburg, and it was a little medieval town. Think of any thing you saw in the movies like Robin Hood or anything like that. They were so poor that they couldn't change anything. So the whole town remained what it was in the 1600s. You could walk up the stairs and go on the walls. And we went to a puppet show, 
and we were supposed to be in the front row. No, if you ever saw Japanese tourists, they're like locusts. They came in and they pushed us out of our row so they could sit in the front. I mean, they, they, they swore. This was, maybe, I imagine now it's even worse, but they, every place, I've seen them all over the world. They swarm with the cameras. They have no courtesy. They, they push everybody aside. So that's what happened. But the next night, uh, we went to a, a little, um, I guess it's sort of a cafe or a pub, and this gentleman was playing music. So he asked if anybody would like to sing. So I love to sing. And I knew only one song in German, <laughs> Brahms' Lullaby, Cradle Song. Right. And I sang it, and I just thought I'd, I'd give the translation. I'll sing just one verse so it won't bore the people. You know, my wife still sings that song, Brahms' Lullaby. It's beautiful. Yeah. I'll sing the second verse, because <laughs> I like the second verse, but I'll translate the first and Good. second. It's very short. Please do. Guten Abend, good Nacht, von England wir wacht, die zeigen in Traum, die Christkindleins Baum, schlaf nun selig und sieß, schau in Traums Paradies. Schlaf nun selig und sieß, schau in Thrums Paradies. Very good. I don't know any German, but, but when I finished, I, the man said, wunderbar. Right. <laughs> I knew what that one. What you word. said was, good evening, good night, and about the Christ child dreaming. Yeah. Right. It says, uh, by angels watch yeah, door, um, you will see, in your dreams, He's you will right. see a fair Christmas that's tree. Right. Uh, go to sleep, close your eyes, you will see paradise. Right. And, and the first verse is pretty, too. It's, it's uh, so good night now once more with Rose's roof door, with bo you know, all tied up with bows, slip under the clothes. When the morning shall break, please the Lord, you shall wake. When the morning shall break, please the Lord, you shall wake. Morgen free, when God tomorrow, will, yeah, tomorrow wirst free. du wieder geweckt. Morgen free, when God will. Yeah, tomorrow <laughs> so, if God wants you, you will wake up again. Right. So see, translations, are, you know the original, I don't, but okay. that was the closest translation. No, that was beautiful. <laughs> so let me apply you for Thank that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, after that, I got to tell you, you also visited a city where I was stationed in, and you went to Salzburg, Austria. Yes, to yes. We took a trip, be, uh, my parents and I, uh, in a few years before that, we went to Vienna. Oh. So one of the trips, the side trip that we could, we could choose where to go, and we chose Salzburg because I love Mozart. The, o the other choice was not too great because maybe they'd let us go to Hungary if the communists let us, maybe not. You had to wait around for hours to get a visa. So we said, no, we'll go to Salzburg instead. <laughs> it was beautiful. We saw where they filmed The Sound of Music. Right, I was up on the hill with the castle. Yeah, it, g gorgeous place. Mozart, right. uh, and we bought that candy. The Mozart Kugel with his picture on it with the beautiful box. It's like an eight-sided box. It's a chocolate-covered nougat or whatever it is. I, get, I have to interrupt you. When I was stationed in Salzburg, they have what they called, there was a little restaurant, and I was stationed at the Hotel Pitta, by the way, which was right across the river from Mozart's house. I think you visited Mozart? Yes, we, we did see it, yes. Right across. It was, uh, they made the best schlugzana. And people didn't know what Schlugzano was, but I had an idea what it was, and I went in there. It's whipped cream, Schlugzano, oh. you know, whipped the cream. We I tell you, I bought it by the pound to eat it, and <laughs> I mean, it was delicious there. And their chocolate that you mentioned, yeah, out of this world, really. And, and what, what my mother and I liked was we'd go, sometimes we wouldn't have a meal. We'd just go walk, like when we were in Munich, we'd walk around, we'd go to a bakery just to have a snack or something, and we liked the chocolate cake. That was really good. The, the strudel? Uh, no, this was cake. Oh. I know what the strudel is, but this was actual cake. It was Black Forest oh, yeah. chocolate cake, really good. And uh, also, the only thing I knew <laughs> to eat of main food was a Wiener schnitzel, because I like veal cutlets. I knew what that was. <laughs> My mother happened to like that, too, so we, we didn't go hungry at any rate when we were in Germany. It's funny you mentioned the Black Forest, because in German it's Schwarzwald, you know? Dark forest. Uh, Schwarz means black. Wald means forest. But it's funny you mentioned that because they did have that delicious cake. They also had uh, 
the whipped cream cake that I was mentioned to you. Oh, I was out yeah. of, I, I mean, I, I was a pig over there, literally. <laughs> okay. They have, they have good food there. Oh, they have terrific food there. I mean, it's even the, they had a restaurant there, Hungarian restaurant, where you could go in and get Hungarian goulash, which was done by other people that were there. You know, it was a lot of DPs that remained in Germany. Right. And they opened up little restaurants, and it was fun. Well, the, the Germany was beautiful. We, we didn't see, we naturally knew about the war, but we didn't really see the devastation. Of course, when I you're on a trip, they take you to the good places. They're not going, who wants to see ruins, you know what I mean? No. So it was beautiful. I mean, the countryside, the, and, and um, you know, the, well, like I said, we, we went to a lot of churches. So I saw different churches, and they talked about some of the churches, the Lutherans and the Catholics would share the church. They would have their service, then the Catholics would have mass, and, and it was like sort of a peaceful, you know, coexistence in the same building. I got to ask you a question, and you could answer it better than I can. Bavaria, Munich, is predominantly Catholic. Yes, that's right. Berlin, the northern part, is predominantly Protestant. How right. did that happen to be? If well, I'm, I'm, well, when, when could, Luther started his revolt, and then a lot of people followed him. Oh, I see. Part of it was religious, but part of it was economic. So. The, the northern people in, in Germany didn't really like the Pope because he was far away. But the people in Bavaria were closer, in Austria, they were closer to right, Rome. Right, they're predominantly Catholic. Yeah, so they, they stayed with the faith, but it also depended on the prince. They had like a million kingdoms in Germany, and, you know, Prince so-and-so, he'd say, I want to be Catholic, and everybody would have to be Catholic. The other prince, maybe across the border in the north, he'd say, no, I want to be Protestant. So everybody would have to be Protestant. You didn't have a choice. Either you did what he said or you left. That was, th there was no choice. So all the people in one part had to be Protestant. And, and it was mostly because if they turned Protestant, they could grab all the property of the church. It was partly economic. It was religious, too. Olivia, I have to tell you, you're a terrific woman to have on the show because Thank you're you. very good in history, and you, you taught me something. <laughs> and you mentioned me, and I wrote it down because I didn't know these things, and so even doing the show, I get a good history lesson. You <laughs> mentioned to me that in 1871, January the 18th, after the defeat of France, Otto Bismarck became the chancellor of Germany yes. when they reunited, yes. and um, Kaiser uh, Wilhelm was proclaimed the emperor. Right. Otto von Bismarck, I believe his name was. Yeah, he was, you know, they had a famous ship named after him. And there's a song because uh, all the allies went after this ship. It was called the Bismarck. Bismarck, right. Remember the song? It was sort of a nice song sink about Sink the Bismarck. How, yeah, yeah, Sink the Bismarck. I don't remember that. I wasn't born, yeah. but I did hear about it. And that's why it was named after him. And he well, was, he was a, he was a, he wanted Germany to be the best, the tops, the conk you know, of the world. It's ironic. They still got that German national anthem today, which to me sort of kind of reminds me of the time of 40, of 40. It's the national anthem which goes, Deutschland, Deutschland, Ebro, Alice, which means Germany, Germany, above all. Yeah. And that was the national anthem when the Nazis were in power, so you, they still have that today. You'd think they would have changed it or changed the world. Well, words, they have two renditions today. They sing the first one and they add a little second one in there. <laughs> So well, I mean, everybody likes their own country, don't get me wrong. Oh, I yeah, love I'm, the USA, but I don't want to take anybody over. You know, I don't want to conquer everybody. No. Well, over there they were fanatical nationalists. We are not, I, I'm a nationalist too, but not a fanatical nationalist. I believe my country is the best in the world. That's I right. Do. I do. But I don't uh, ridicule the other countries. I think no. that if I was living in France, Germany, or Austria, I would think the same as I do about my country in the United States. Absolutely. But we, we never went at, we didn't go say, like, after the war, we didn't say, okay, we won. We're going to take everything. We just went home. No, you know? we didn't, but the Soviets did. Oh, yeah, they did. They cleaned out the factories. They cleaned out everything. They left nothing right. for the reunification, but, so the Germans had nothing there. We left everything where it was. And not only that, we started rebuilding. The minute the right. war was over, we started rebuilding for them, the right. Marshall Plan. Yes. I think that was a wonderful thing. It helped all the people. It was good for us, too, but it helped all those poor people that, that had nothing really to do with the war. They were just slaves, you know. They... It, it wasn't their choice, they just had to obey, you know what I mean? So yeah. what, what country got so powerful like we did, and all we left in Europe was the, the dead of our Troops, men? Right. What did we get? We got a few cemeteries. Nobody can say that we got anything, that we, st you know, got uh, 
countries, that we got colonies, like any other country would have done. Nobody ever says that. We're always bad, bad, bad. That's what they, I, people say. I know that, but you know, it's no democratic country ever went to war against another country. I'm talking about a true democracy right. where you can elect a president. Right. Or a, you know, where we have the elections like we have here. It's always been the dictators that have started wars. Think That's of it. That's right. It's always been the dictators. I mean, we're not going to fight with Canada. <laughs> no, we, I mean, Canada's not going to fight with us either. No. We're fine to get living together. We, we're good neighbors. I worry sometimes about the South, though. Yeah. I'm not talking South. Uh, the Latin South America. East, uh, Latin America. I worry about them sometimes. Yeah. Especially when you have dictators like in Venezuela, like Chavez. Oh, Hugo. yes. Okay. You know, that, uh, well, that's the, a... Uh, you're absolutely right. We're absolutely right. And Cuba. Olivia, uh, we got about two minutes left. Believe okay. it or not, take a minute to say whatever <laughs> you like. Uh, just leave me one minute. Okay. Well, I, I've enjoyed being on. The time flies by. Uh, it certainly <laughs> did. And uh, I had a good time, and I thank you. It's, it's a real honor to be asked to come on, and um, thank you very much. It's an honor for me to have guests like you come on, really, because without people like you, we wouldn't have a show here. I mean, I'd be talking to the four walls, so it's nice because you and I reminisced about the trips that we, and I spent uh, three years there. Oh. It was nice to have you come on our show. So, Olivia, let me say thank you for taking the time. And you're very welcome. And since you're a religious lady, I can say God bless you and take good care of you. Thank you very much, and God bless you as well. Thank you, and God bless the people of Revere, but most of all, God bless our troops overseas yes and our great country the united states of america and olivia thank you again for coming on revere veterans and community show and folks i hope we have another great guest like olivia ferranti the next time we meet on the air thank you <laughs>